Hello and welcome to INST 615, Information Professionals in the Law. My name is Dr. Galliano. I hope that your semester is off to a great start thus far. Now, the main lecture for Module 2 is presented by Catherine McGuire of the Thurgood Marshall State Law Library. And she does a fantastic job of walking us through the various sources of law. Now this module to what I call a mini lecture, uh, I felt was important uh, because we're going to cover what it means when we use the term access in this course. And it's significant enough that I wanted to devote a short amount of time to that. So in the lecture, we'll talk about three levels of access, physical, intellectual, and social. Let's start with physical. Now physical access is often, uh, you know, the first thing that we think of. We're all familiar with physical access. And the first thing that usually comes to mind of when we think of access, and it's really about getting your hands on the document or other form of uh, information that embodies that which you seek. So one way of thinking about this is going to the county courthouse. Maybe you need a property deed or a marriage license or a building permit or something like that, right? So you have to get to the courthouse. You have to enter the courthouse. You have to find the correct office. And then you have to actually be granted some kind of possession, physical possession of that document. That's all about physical access. Now, it's not so different when it comes to the law. Until the last couple of decades, you needed physical access to a law library because that's where the law lived. That's where you could find the books, the law books. And if you've ever spent any time in a law library, then uh, the graphic on this next slide, uh, which I need to advance, uh, is probably going to evoke some kind of a, a visceral uh, response from you. You might even remember the smell of those books, right? That's that's the kind of impact that uh, you know that that physical access provides to us. So um, think about what this means for a moment, though. It wasn't until uh, maybe the late '90s, mid '90s, at the earliest, probably uh, certainly into the early 2000s, that we saw the shift uh, toward online legal information to actually take place, right? Now, the books haven't went away in the largest sense. They're still there. Um, and some people prefer to use the physical books, the printed copy, particularly in certain situations. Uh, and, you know, maybe that's because they're more comfortable with the books because that's how they learned. Uh, that's what they're familiar with. That's what they can be effective and efficient with and not so much with technology. Um you know, very little doubt that we get set in our ways. Uh, people already know how to use the books, um, and so they see no driving need to make a switch to an online system in which they have to become proficient in all over again. Uh, so that said, physical access uh, today certainly involves access to materials that are held in online databases or that can be found on various websites. So even though we do it in a virtual sense, it's still kind of physical access, isn't it? Now, the way it, it occurs is different. The way we think about it may be different. Where we actually do it is certainly different. But this is all still about getting physical access to the materials. Uh, and that shift means that we can access the law virtually, uh, which takes away a significant barrier. But it also raises some other concerns, doesn't it? So first, can you get to the information you're looking for? Now, it may no longer be about getting on a city bus or driving a vehicle to a law library, right? But you still have to get on a computer and you have to navigate the internet to the virtual address of that law library. So in a sense, it's not so much different. So that's where we need to think about whether someone has the means to get there virtually, right? So do they have a computer or at least a smartphone or some other device in which they can conduct online searches of databases and websites? 
And do they have an account? Can they get an account that allows virtual access and corresponding levels of authorization? Uh, think about what it means to get access to the Internet these days, right? Now, we all kind of take it for granted because we have homes and we have Internet access for which we pay a monthly fee, and that stuff is just there for us to use. But what if you don't have a home? What if you're homeless? What if you don't have uh, ready access to a computer? Then you can see these barriers starting to come up. Now, this is all a great segue to information security, and I want to underscore that. So there's a model we use in the InfoSec business called the CIA model. Now, that is not the Central Intelligence Agency, although it doesn't make this name of this model easy to remember. The CIA triad is so named because it helps us conceptualize three very important InfoSec principles. First, the C stands for confidentiality. That's the principle that information is sufficiently protected from those who should not have access to it. Now, most often we think of encryption, right? So as your information is traversing the internet, uh, not anybody can just pull that information down and readily access it. They would first have to crack that strong encryption, right? So it's about protecting the information. The I stands for integrity. That's a really important principle that information or data is protected from tampering. And I want you to think about that for a second because as a hacker or as an adversary working for a nation state or even a crime syndicate, if I can get access to your information and pull that back, exfiltrate it, I may be able to use that to hold you at ransom. I may be able to use that information to get some kind of a competitive advantage on you. I may be able to use that information to make some kind of a technological advance that I otherwise would not be able to make on my own. But I can do something that's uh, a little bit more insidious. I can access your information and I can slightly alter it. Uh, I can make key changes to mathematical formulas or recipes or, uh, you know, a script that runs on a server. So integrity is about protecting information from tampering. The final uh, part of that triad is the A, which stands for availability. And that's a, the principle that the information is there when it is needed, that I can access it and use that information on demand and when it suits me to do so, right? That it's not being taken offline or being attacked in some way that prevents me from getting to it. So physical access then is fundamentally a core requirement. Now, whether we call it physical or virtual, um, we have to have that in place before we can get to the other levels of access that we're going to talk about. It's not enough just to have the physical access, right? It's not enough just to get a law book from a library. I then have to do something with that book, right? Uh, I need meaningful access. That is uh, information that is in that book or on that website. So that takes us to intellectual access. Intellectual access is the ability to understand or comprehend the information that you have now been granted access to. So you now have that book in your hand or you're now on that website the information is there, but what do you do with it, right? And intellectual access is really about uh, comprehending the information and being able to communicate that information to others. Now, one of the challenges, particularly in uh, the legal profession, is that uh, legal information tends to be complex. Uh, and for those in the profession, there is a jargon and a way of communicating that information, of writing it and understanding it, that to the layperson uh, may not be so transparent. It may not be so easily, easily graspable to those who are not trained in the law or really have no grounding in the law, let alone training. Now, I'll tell you a little story here um, that you may find somewhat amusing. So years ago, uh, I was working in a, a U.S. Air Force uh, weather station as a meteorologist. 
and we were making the transition from a uh, physical to virtual representation of weather data. So in those old days uh, of the early 90s, we would hand plot these huge charts that we would then tack up to the wall. And uh, a weather observer would plot the information and then somebody, a meteorologist, would come along and analyze it and provide meaning to that information, right? Provide context and meaning. And um, that's the way the meteorological business had been conducted for decades, right? Um, we started to make that transition to a digital representation of the information, virtual access if you prefer. And so there, uh, there, were, there was a lot of training that occurred and we had to write a lot of what we call standard operating procedures. Uh, and one of the things that you ran to do quite a bit would be it would tell you step by step, right? You'd get down to that, uh, the how to portion of a policy document. And it would say, you know, do this, press this key, click on this menu, uh, or it might use the language press any key. You may have run across that yourself, right? It doesn't matter, just any key on the keyboard to proceed, right? And it would say press any key. And our, uh, our senior meteorologist actually, uh, operational forecaster, uh, was a man who had spent many years in the Air Force, uh, was very well steeped in meteorological processes, excellent forecaster, and had been forecasting in the same location. Incidentally, this was Tucson, Arizona, for many years. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he was just a wealth of knowledge. But he wasn't so good at technology, and he resisted it. Uh, and he couldn't wrap his head around this concept of any key. And it was so frustrating to him that he took a Sharpie and on this white, pristine keyboard on the space bar, he wrote in big quotes, any key. Now, when I saw that, when I came into work and saw it for the first time, I said, who in the heck did this to my keyboard? And I just happened to be relieving this individual. And he said, in a more colorful metaphor, he said, uh, don't worry about it. Now we know what the any key is. And, you know, that stuck with me through the years, right? So that's that idea of intellectual access, then, uh, perhaps in a very simplistic example. Uh, now, we could take it uh, a little bit differently. Think about, uh, you know, a hearing that might come before a judge, uh, you know, dealing with child custody and visitation rights. Uh, the parties that are involved... Um, they may not even have legal representation. Even if they do, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the attorneys involved may not be taking the time to completely understand or rather explain uh, in a way that can be understood to people who don't know the law about all those complex issues involved and what it means to be in compliance, right? Uh, and so it makes it difficult then for the layperson to understand the language used by the court. So let's then move to the third level of access is what we call social access. It is considered the most advanced level. Um, so here, not only do you have to have physical or virtual access to the law, not only do you have to have an understanding or comprehension of the law and being able to communicate it, uh, but here you have to be able to use that information uh, to put it to use in specific settings of interest, right? Um, there's also the idea that uh, social access may be tied to a user's attitude about the use of technology. So in my little anecdote, right, my coworker, who was well steeped in uh, meteorological phenomena and forecasting and aviation and all those things, right, was struggling with the use of technology. And the attitude that he had towards it was not a positive one. Uh, also, I want you to think about how social media has been used over the past uh, few years or the last decade or so to propagate both misinformation and disinformation. Uh, but then also how the other side of that double-edged sword, how social media has been used for positive educational purposes. In both cases, right, the reach that social media provides far eclipses that of the printed page in many cases, right? You may not have access to a law library, but you almost certainly can 
access or get access to the internet where you conduct searches of those same principles that are contained in books online. So with that, as we move through the course, uh, we must keep in mind that legal information is often complex to the layperson, and that as information professionals, we play a unique and a key role in brokering access and understanding of the law to the public. Uh, so with that, I hope you enjoy Catherine McGuire's lecture from the Thurgood Marshall State Law Library, and I will see you on the discussion board. So long.